Today we're looking at uh, the very first section in the prerequisite chapter that comes from our, our orange recount book. And so what we're doing is introducing some of the topics in the section which have to do with discrete pairs of points. So we're talking about slope and distance and midpoint in this section. And so here are a few topics to get us started. With the ordered pairs in the Cartesian plane, um, we're describing both a horizontal placement and a vertical placement, right? So as you know, in quadrant number one, your points are going to have both positive x and positive y coordinates. Here in quadrant two, we'll have a negative x and a positive y. And in quadrant three, we have both negative x and negative y. And in quadrant four, positive x and negative y, right? So we label those quadrants in this counterclockwise direction and we use Roman numerals to do that as well. So in a bit we're going to be talking about where do you find a point with these, with these qualities. Notice they're not just giving you an ordered pair, they're giving you clues with these inequality symbols. And so before we jump into that, we need to remember the difference between a horizontal and a vertical line and the equation that it is written. So you might remember this phrase from a previous math class. We say vux hoi as a way to memorize the difference between a vertical line and a horizontal line. So V stands for a vertical line. A vertical line has undefined slope. And its equation is x equals some number. In other words, you only see the x, you don't see the y in that equation. So for example, you might have x equals 2. Okay? H stands for a horizontal line. And a horizontal line has zero slope. That doesn't mean no slope, zero as a measurement, right? It's neither positive nor negative. So zero slope. And then its equation is y equals some number, where you see just the y and you don't see the x at all. So for example, you could have y equals five, right? So that would be the equation of horizontal line. X equals two is an example of a vertical line. So let's take a look at example number one. Where would we find, what quadrant would we be in when we find an ordered pair with the, these qualities, right? When x is less than zero and y is less than zero. Now because we're comparing it to zero, we can think of it as negative, right? X is less than zero means x is negative. <coughs> Excuse me, x is negative and we also have y is negative. So as you can tell, that will put us here in quadrant three. Here in part B, now we're comparing values that are not zero. So we're going to draw a little bit of a sketch here. You might be able to picture this in your mind, but let's go ahead and create our Cartesian coordinate system. Put down a few tick marks and a scale of ones for each of those tick marks. So here we have our first clue. X is greater than two, so you only see the X. That means we have a vertical line. And because it's an inequality, when we graph that vertical line, on the, it's passing the x-axis at two. We don't use a solid line, we use a dashed line. If it was x equals two, then it would be a solid line. Here it's x is greater than two, so it's a dashed line, and then we shade everything to the right. So that covers two quadrants. That covers both quadrants one and four. So now we bring in the second clue, y equals three. That's an example of a horizontal line. And this will be a solid line passing through the y-axis at 3. So what we're doing is looking to see where do they overlap. Where does this line overlap with the shaded region? And so you can see it's all of these points that sit on that line in quadrant 1. Here is part C. Where is x greater than 0 and y less than or equal, uh, just less than negative 2? So again, here's a little sketch my xy axis, a few tick marks, and a scale of 1. So with x being greater than 0, I will draw a dashed vertical line at 0. And again, we're shading to the right. So again, possible answers are quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. Here we have a horizontal line with the y. So y is less than negative 2. So a dashed line at negative 2. And because y is less than that, we're shading 
everything below. And again, we look to see where the fields overlap, and you can see they overlap in this region, which is in quadrant four only. So that's our answer. For this last one, it's a little bit different. We only have one clue instead of a pair, and they're actually telling us to do an operation. They're saying take your x-coordinate and multiply it to your y-coordinate, and that answer has to be less than zero. So we want a negative answer. So if you think about this first sketch, if I were in quadrant one, I would be multiplying a positive x with a positive y-coordinate. That would give me a positive answer. That doesn't meet this criteria of less than zero. So quadrant one is out. Quadrant three is also out because if we multiply a negative x with a negative y, that would give us a positive answer. So it turns out we have two quadrants, two and four, that meet this requirement. When you multiply the x with the y-coordinate because you have one negative sign in there, you end up with two possibilities with a negative answer. So quadrants two and four are going to be your answer there. All right, so that's top, topic number one. Now topic number two, we're going to use the distance formula in a few different ways. But first of all, we're going to derive it. And so to derive it, that means let's explain a connection between the Pythagorean theorem and how we calculate horizontal distance and vertical distance uh, and sort of assemble those together and explain where the distance formula comes from using these basic ideas. So if you just have a horizontal number line, and for example, there's your horizontal number line and you're trying to figure out how far is it from one point to another, oftentimes we can just count one, two, three. But if you have actual values, you can do a subtraction problem. You can go five minus two, you're just subtracting those x coordinates. And that's true for a vertical number line as well. You just subtract those y coordinates. Distance always has to be positive, which is why you see those absolute values on it. So how do we then find the length of a slanted line if all I know is how to find the length of a horizontal or a vertical line? What we're going to do is turn this into a triangle by creating a vertical edge and a horizontal edge. There's your right angle. So there's my triangle ABC. And now you can see we have a vertical and horizontal component. So we're taking that slanted line and creating a vertical and horizontal component, thinking of it as a triangle. So this is my horizontal line. How do I find its distance? By subtracting those X coordinates found at points B and C. Again, it has to be positive, so we have the absolute value on there. We find the vertical distance by subtracting those coordinates as well, y sub 2 minus y sub 1. And what we want to do now is recognize that because we have this right triangle, we can use this Pythagorean theorem now to bring all of these ideas together in one equation. So that doesn't look like the distance formula, but we're about to transform it into one. So let's drop in this expression for a absolute value of x sub 2 minus x sub 1 quantity b squared. And then drop this expression in for b, absolute value of y sub 2 minus y sub 1 quantity squared. Again, it might not look like the distance formula just yet. We're going to make a couple of changes here. First of all, we don't need the absolute value. We just need the parentheses themselves because the absolute values makes this value positive, but so does the exponent of two. When you square a value, it always becomes positive. So this is redundant. So instead of the absolute values, we'll just replace them with the exponent of two and grouping those together. And then lastly, let's get the length of C by itself. We'll take the square root of both sides. And now this looks like your traditional distance formula. So that's called a derivation. We're deriving where it came from. We're explaining where that distance formula came from using some basic components of horizontal length, vertical length, connecting them all together with the Pythagorean theorem. Now, Let's do an example using the distance formula. In example two, we're going to show that these three points form a right triangle. So there's two elements to this. We're not going to plot the points, but we do need to know the lengths of the sides. So let's find the length from point A to point B. So here's the distance formula. Subtract those x coordinates. We have five and one, so five minus one quantity squared. Subtract those y coordinates of negative two and five, so negative two minus five quantity squared. And simplifying what's in the parentheses first, we end up with a 4 that has to be squared 
and a negative 7 that has to be squared. So we end up with 16 and 49, totaling in 65 under the radical, so root 65. Now we need the second side, so let's find the length from b to c. My x-coordinates are 1 and 5, so 1 minus 5, quantity squared, we'll add to that. The y-coordinates are both negative 2, so negative 2 minus a negative 2. Remember, subtracting a negative is the same as adding a positive. So we have a 1 minus 5, give me a negative 4 that I need to square. And negative 2 plus 2 just cancels out, so that's a 0 squared. So in other words, we just really have the first term of 16, and that's exactly a length of 4. Here's the final side from point A to point C. My x-coordinates are 1 and 1, so 1 minus 1, we'll see that will drop out in a moment. And the y-coordinates are negative 2 and 5, so negative 2 minus 5, quantity squared, means that we really just have a negative 7 that we need to square. And the square root of 49 is exactly 7. So we have the three side lengths of our triangle. But how do we know if they form a right triangle? Well, that's what the Pythagorean theorem is all about. If the triangle is the right triangle, then this equation will be true. If this equation is false, then it's some other kind of triangle. So the next step is to use the Pythagorean theorem. Now we want to make sure we plug in the longest side length in for C, and with the root 65, you might not be sure if that is the longest side or not. You can look at the decimal value using your calculator to determine what its decimal value is, and it will be the longest side, so we'll just go ahead and drop it in right here. Not the decimal value, but its exact value, root 65, quantity squared, and then we'll set that equal to 4 squared plus 7 squared. So here on the left-hand side, the square and the square root cancel out. On the right, we have 16 plus 49. We add those together, and it turns out that we do have a true statement. That means the triangle with these measurements is, in fact, a right triangle. So triangle ABC is a right triangle. So one of the homework problems is actually going to ask you about a parallelogram. That's why you see this homework hint down here. It's been a frequent question in past years. How do I know if my lengths are a parallelogram? Well, remember that in a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite sides have to have the same length. So you're going to do yeah, four distance formulas, and if both pairs, are this, both pairs of opposite sides are equal in length, then you know it's a parallelogram. All right, let's look at a few more examples for distance and then also midpoint formula. If you flip that over to the next side, you see the formulas at the top of the page. We're going to be using these both today and in the next section of notes tomorrow. Here is example three. We're using the midpoint formula, which you've done before, but what you may not have done is work with fractions inside the midpoint formula, right? So we're using things you've seen before, but asking questions in new ways, pushing it a little bit here. So the midpoint formula says add up those x-coordinates. Well, I have an x-coordinate of 1 fourth and negative 7 halves. All that has to be over 2. And then the y-coordinates also are going to be added up and set over 2. So you can see that looks really strange to have a fraction inside of a fraction. That's why we're doing it as an example so we can walk you through it. Now when you're adding fractions, you have to make sure you have a common denominator. So 1 fourth plus I would like to turn this into something in terms of fourths. So let's multiply that negative 7 halves by 2 over 2. And here with the y coordinates, I would like a common denominator of 3. So let's multiply that 1 over 1 with a 3 over 3. So now what that means for us is that we have, with our x coordinates, we have common denominator of 4. So this is negative 14 over 4. So 1 fourth minus 14 fourths gives me a negative 13 fourths. And then for the y coordinates, we have 3 thirds plus 2 thirds is 5 thirds. So when we're looking at this fraction divided by 2, it helps to think of that 2 as 2 over 1, so it is also a fraction. So you have a fraction on the top half and a fraction on the bottom half. And when you are dividing with fractions, you instead multiply by the reciprocal. So you take the first fraction as is, change the division to multiplication, and then flip the two upside down so it's actually one half. So that's what we mean by multiply by the reciprocal. 
your y coordinate will be 5 thirds times 1 half. And so that gives us a final result of negative 13 over 8 and 5 over 6. So if you were to do this problem on your own, you might be tempted to turn that into a decimal value, but please don't. What we're doing is we're practicing with our skills with fractions, and they come up from time to time, even more frequently further down the road in our own semester two. And so when you have a fraction as a problem, leave your answer in the same format. Here's another example where it's a similar type of question, but asked in a brand new way. Find x so that the distance between these two points is 5. So notice they're already giving us the distance. So we're using the distance formula. But instead of calculating the distance, we will start with the distance of 5 and work backwards to find the missing coordinate point. So we're using the distance formula that you see at the top of the page right there. So here's the distance of 5 equals the square root of... And then let's subtract those x coordinates. So 2 and x, 2 minus x quantity squared. That might look weird, but that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to solve for that variable plus. Now the y coordinates are negative 1 and 3. So negative 1 minus 3 quantity squared. So it might be easiest to start by squaring both sides. We don't have the radical on every line. So now we have 25 on the left. And on the right hand side, Let's simplify this. So negative 1 minus 3 is a negative 4, and I need to square that. It becomes a 16. And then we're going to subtract 16 as we move all of the constants to the constant terms to the left-hand side because we're trying to isolate this binomial here and eventually isolate the x itself. So those are the first few key steps. So to get x by itself, we have to eliminate this power of 2, so take the square root of both sides. And on the right-hand side, the square and the square root cancel out. On the left-hand side, yeah, you know it's 3, but don't forget the plus or minus. You actually have two answers. We're going to get two answers out of this. So what that means is we either have the positive version, 3 equals 2 minus x, or we have the negative version, negative 3 equals 2 minus x. So we'll subtract 2 from both sides and then divide away the negative one to get a positive x. So what that means is we have these two possible x coordinates so that when you use either one of those at that location, and if you were to calculate the distance, it would be a distance of five from the one point to the next. The last topic for today is rate of change. This is a percent increase or decrease which is quite similar to the slope formula, but we're not setting this problem up as a slope. We're going to use this to calculate that percent. So we have some information about Starbucks here. From 2016, they earned a lot of money. And in 2018, they earned even more money. Let's calculate the percent change in that revenue. So we're not calculating the percent change of the year, the time frame. It's just in the revenue, just in the dollar amount. So we're just focusing on the dollars, not the years. That's why we're not using the slope formula. You can also think of slope as the rate of change, but here we're going to format it as a percent. So we're taking the recent data, which is this one, right? So this is my more recent information, and there's my older information back from 2016. Okay, so the more recent information is the 24.72. Of course, that's in billions, and we're subtracting the 21.316, and that will be divided by that same 21.316. So this is just calculator work now. If I do the subtraction, I get 3.404, and then when we divide it by the 21.316, we have a decimal value, and you'll see I'm going to write down more decimals than we might normally consider. So 0.15969, and the reason is because we want a percent. So take that decimal and move it two places to the right. And so what we're seeing is a positive result. That means it's growth. So we have a 15%, and here's our decimal value on that, 15%. So it practically rounds up to 16, but there it is. 15.969% is the growth. If it were negative, that means you would be losing money over time. Here it's positive instead. And that's the end of our notes today.